Um, and our, our guest speaker, David Goldhill, has a very personal relationship to healthcare. Um, his father, Paul, was a practicing psychiatrist. He was 83 years old, he was still working, and he went into the hospital, and they thought he had pneumonia. And in three, 36 hours, he got sepsis. He got the blood, blood uh, infection known as sepsis. And over the next five weeks in the ICU, he got a wave of secondary infections, and then he died. And a week after his death, um, our guest um, read an article by Atul Gwande in The New Yorker that was a profile of Peter Pronovost, um, the, the Hopkins doctor, who was all about um, improving care in ICUs. And, and David's question was why, you know, he was just sort of stunned. Why aren't those ideas being accepted more quickly in American hospitals? Now, it turns out David is not a healthcare analyst. He's CEO of the, of the, um, of, of the, it's the game show, formerly known as the Game Show Media Network and now GSN, GNS. Um, in fact, when he was on Stephen Colbert a few days ago, um, Stephen said to him, oh, do you have a game show where you spin a wheel and you get, you get a kidney? It turns out, um, no, the answer would be no. Um, but, but what David did is uh, very few people do. He channeled his grief into a quest. And he ended up writing an article for, in 2009 for the, for the Atlantic called How American Healthcare Killed My Father. Um, and he now has a book that was published in January um, with pretty much the same title, How American Healthcare Killed My Father. He has some unique ideas about healthcare, about doing catastrophic care. Um, and doing it as, as a form of national health insurance. But he's turned out, he's become a, a unique spokesman on this issue, and I hope you all give a warm welcome to David Goldhill. Uh, thank you, Carl. And thanks to everybody in this room for all your many and extraordinary and almost completely unattributed contributions to my book. Um, <laughs> A lot of it is based on uh, uh, is based on what I've read in your work. Uh, Carl's right about the reason I'm here. My initial interest in healthcare was what happened to my father. Uh, this is a picture of my dad with my son. Uh, my son needed an appendectomy a couple of months ago. We took him into a hospital. Turns out his appendix uh, had ruptured, as, as we found out very shortly after bringing him in. We saw the surgeon, and before we could meet with the surgeon, we had to fill out an eight-page form that took us about ten minutes. Surgeon said, almost certainly an appendix, may well be rupturing, let's do a quick scan while I get an operating room ready. We go down, same hospital, four floors to the scan department uh, in radiology. We have to fill out the identical form. My son is doubled over in pain, which it turns out with a ruptured appendix. I would guess we filled out, we had to fill out another form before being admitted to the operating room. We then had a five hour delay for the operation. Uh, during which the doctor quite sensibly ordered uh, uh, morphine for my son. It took an hour and a half to get the morphine, although the pharmacy was 100 feet away. And if you want a good argument for gun control, <laughs> if my wife had been armed, um, why do I tell that story in light of my father? Because. The argument I'm going to make is that the cause of both my father's death and having to fill out age page forms is the same. Uh, what I'm going to try, what my book tries to convince people of, uh, is that the incentives in healthcare are fundamentally broken. That uh, the, the way you make money in healthcare, and healthcare is a business, uh, even if we make it public, it will still be the way 15 million people earn their living, is by practicing excess care at high prices of often questionable value and underinvest in service and safety. It's one thing. Now, admittedly, it's hard to make a case in the world we have that the villain is structural, it's incentives, it's not the evil insurers or the evil drug companies or the union, whatever team you're on, the opposing team. But my argument actually is it is all about these incentives I think politicians don't really understand what incentives are. They think they're rules. But in fact, what incentives are, are they're things with feedback loops uh, that in the economy is generally provided by consumers. And so the argument I make is that until we restore consumers, patients as they're called in healthcare, to a normal place in healthcare, 
we have no chance of getting the incentives right. Anything we do will just be tinkering around the edges. Um, and I'd like to convince you of that, but I'm not going to try. What I want to talk about today is something different, which is why, if I tried to convince you of that, you'd be skeptical. Uh, one of the arguments that I think is most important is that healthcare has this massive set of conventional wisdom that so limits our ability to look at it more flexibly. I, I got to tell you, if your argument is healthcare is more normal uh, than people think it is, that it really can function the way a normal industry, the way a normal service does, you're not going to get a lot of reception in a group of healthcare economists or healthcare policymakers. That, hey, guess what? There doesn't need to be this specialty, is not exactly a way to get yourself welcome. But I want to talk about the conventional wisdom that dominates the way we think about healthcare and why it's either outdated, outgrown, or was wrong in the first place. The most important thing that we all know is that we can't afford healthcare. That without insurance, it would be impossible for any of us to deal with the health care crisis. And we all know that. So I run about a 300-person company, and a lot of the people in our company are young. And I see up close the cost of health insurance on their compensation. In my book, I look at a 23-year-old woman who's actually a real person uh, and say, OK, she's starting out her career, talented, but let's just assume that her income grows at 3% a year, which is historically what a sort of middle class person would see their income grow at, uh, maybe a little lower. Uh, and let's assume that health care costs are tamed, that they grow at no more than what the Affordable Care Act predicts for the next 10 years, and after that, they grow at zero. So if this young woman, who I call Becky, lives to 80, has a couple kids, gets married, is the primary breadwinner, she will pour $1.8 million into our healthcare system over her lifetime. That's assuming a couple things. One is that Becky never gets rich, and the second is that Becky and her family never get sick, because there's not significant out-of-pocket shown here. Uh, there, there's, there's actually a mistake I made when I tried to move the slides around today, but the big numbers, the Medicare premiums were $20,000. It's repeated the visible cost, and I'm not good enough to know how to get it back to where it was. But what are you looking at here? You're looking at $570,000 that she's going to pour into the system that she'll see, that she'll be aware of, and a million three that she probably doesn't, isn't even aware she's pouring into the system. A million eight for a middle class family. If her spouse works, it's two million two. Um, I'm willing to bet there are very few families in America who aren't confident they can handle their health care burdens on $2.2 million. Now, for those of you who are into discounting and all the rest, Let's assume that cost of health care grows by zero starting the moment I said that. It's probably no longer true. But that number would be 1.25 million. There's no magic growth in this that's driving it. It's what we're paying today. Myth number one, we cannot afford our own health care. How 100% of Americans believe someone else is paying their health care is the ultimate delusion in this system. Let's do something else with Becky. Let's talk about paying for the poor or the needy. Let's take a third of it away from her family. Now her family only has a million two, and a poor family has 600 and something thousand. Almost no one ever spends that in health care in their lifetime. That's how much this system takes in administration, complexity, et cetera. If you took the $850 billion we will spend this year on subsidizing Medicare and paying for Medicaid, you could write a check for $8,500 to 100 million Americans and change their lives and actually have a decent operating health care system. So myth number one, there's just not enough money. I don't know where you think the 2.8 trillion is coming from. It's coming from everybody in this room. So another thing we believe is health care is a good thing. Um, we believe it more than anyone else so that our public health care programs are entitlements. We'll pay for anything you need. Now, if you've ever been in business, you know that when someone says we'll pay for anything you need, that may be the greatest opportunity in history, right? What has this industry done? It has massively expanded the definition of need. This is the healthiest generation of seniors in the history of mankind. It's not even close. The average healthy senior, listed by Medicare as being in either excellent or very good health, will spend $5,500 on health care this year. If you have a senior relative, or you're senior yourself, but my mother is a senior, uh, although she denies it, um, 
and is in fantastic health, the amount of medical attention they're getting is genuinely frightening. If you're at the other end of it, you have an unhealthy senior, we're basically torturing these people to death. The question always is asked in our society, how much Medicare can we afford? The question I ask is how much more Medicare can seniors withstand? One third of seniors have surgery in the year of their death. 20% of 90 year olds have surgery in the year of their death, and there's almost no really recommended surgery for a 90 year old. Um, the average senior is now taking five or more prescription drugs. And what's interesting is when you look at the type of care we're funding in Medicare, a lot of it is things related to lifestyle and comfort, and many of these may be good things. But keep in mind, we have no break. There is no budget. There's nothing except tell us what you need, and we'll pay for it. Now, if you want everyone to, to nod their head yes in a conference of healthcare experts, you will show this slide. We have to have everything funded uh, by insurance and healthcare because 10% of the population in any given year consumes 70% of the care. By definition, that tells you that we must have insurance. Uh, this, this is what I refer to as island thinking. I'm not sure anyone's ever made the statement who knows anything about any other industry. So let me, let me help with that. In any given year, 10% of Americans buy 100% of the cars. In any given year, less than 10% of Americans buy 100% of the college educations, 100% of the weddings, 100% of the refrigerators, 100% of any expensive good and service that we will all use, only a few of us use in any given year. It's true of every industry that exists, except healthcare. This slide says the opposite of what everyone in healthcare thinks it says. What this slide says is what's remarkable about healthcare for an expensive service is that 90% of us use as much as 30% of it. In fact, uh, Paul Starr wrote that we could never have a normal economy in healthcare because 90% of the population uses only 30% of the care. That's too, too much of a sliver to really matter. That sliver is $800 billion. So if $800 billion is too, much, is too little to run a normal economy, how on earth did the pet rock industry get started without government aid? <laughs> now, there's obviously one big difference in healthcare. There are some people who are in that 10% every single year. There are some people who are genuinely sick, who have long-term illnesses, right? But the interesting thing about the way we think about healthcare is we define the whole system on the basis of the most extreme cases. So it would be as if we decided to insure everything in your house, including your furniture, from going out of style, because a few people were going to have their house burned down. There are some things that definitely make sense to cover by insurance, but not everything, not everyone, all the time. Here's another myth. We consumers aren't smart enough to navigate our way through the system. There's no way you could have consumer-driven care because consumers don't know anything. We'll talk about a couple of elements. So we're lucky to have insurers between us and healthcare providers. So my dad is lucky enough to have Medicare handle all the things while he's dying. But here's the interesting thing about having that great surrogate. Uh, Medicare billed my dad for a few unpaid expenses three years after his death, which may suggest that they weren't the best fiduciary for him. Uh, they also paid a significantly greater amount of money for the service of killing him than, let's say, my mother would have. My hunch is if we had to present that bill to my mother, my mother's an incredibly polite woman, but um, they, they wouldn't have gotten a penny, and we wouldn't have 100,000 deaths. That's an incentive. Um, here's another fun thing about having insurers between us and healthcare providers and what a great job they do of protecting us. This is the first response from our insurer, our corporate insurer. Keep in mind, I'm CEO of their client. Uh, as to my son's ruptured appendix, and, you know, I'm, I'm determined to make Tom Grolke famous. Um, I guess he is an actual doctor, but they haven't determined that the correct course of action for ruptured appendix is an appendectomy. Um, and in fairness, in fairness, if my son had been a pet, we might have put him down. So there were alternatives. Um, but from a human medical point of view, I could not find another possible treatment. Um, now... We're, we've all gotten these, right? It's the first thing now insurers do to make sure you actually have to fight to get your money. But what you don't think is, wait a minute, isn't their job to be, isn't that why we have them? Because we told ourselves we couldn't do it. 
navigating our current system of care, whether you are privately insured, on Medicare, or God forbid on Medicaid, is impossible. It's really hard. We haven't made this any easier for ourselves. Um, the father of this type of thinking is Kenneth Arrow, who 50 years ago wrote what may be the most influential academic piece on healthcare finance, where he talked about what well, the fancy term is information asymmetry between patient and doctor. And what Arrow said is, look, the doctor is all the information, the patient is none, the patient's desperate, the patient's a terrible customer, he'll buy anything the doctor sells him in crude economic terms. So you need an intermediary. This market will never function normally. I suspect Kenneth Arrow was wrong when he wrote that. Admittedly, he has a Nobel Economics Prize. I don't. But, uh, and I have enormous respect. It's an incredibly well-written and important article. But let me ask you to consider things that have happened since Ken Arrow wrote this article. The first thing that's happened is healthcare has changed a lot. We've gone from getting healthcare when we get hit by a bus or suddenly struck down with a life-threatening illness to having it all the time. 100% uh, of the American population will have a chronic condition at some point in their life that will have long-term management, 100%. Uh, healthcare is integrated in our lives in ways that Dr. Arrow never could have imagined. We also have, here I use TripAdvisor, which is the best one in the, in, in, in the best industry at this. We have a massive amount of information available to consumers in ways that we could not have imagined 50 years ago. And then we have a third thing which is there are relatively few treatments in which it's like fixing a car. Eh, it's the carburetor. We've got to fix the carburetor. Most of it now is here are your alternatives. Here are your options, whether the doctor tells you or not. The best ones do, of course. Think about it. How should we proceed? The consumer's got to do the work anyway, right? That's changed from when Dr. Arrow wrote. The most important thing, though, that's changed is we have 50 years of history that tell us that he was wrong. Uh, there's that famous old joke about the bear chasing two guys in the, uh, in the forest, and one guy stops to change and put on a pair of sneakers, and his friend says, you idiot, you can't outrun a bear. The guy says, I don't have to outrun a bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> Why does that joke apply here? Because Kenneth Arrow is right. Consumers are complete idiots when it comes to health care. In fact, there's 50 years of research that show we're complete idiots when it comes to everything. Insurers and Medicare is worse. We can outrun them. A system based on our needs as opposed to theirs will function better even though we're idiots. Right? We don't have to be rational. And one of the mistakes I think people make in talking about consumer-driven care is they don't understand consumer-driven care isn't about us waking up in the morning and studying all the reports Charlie has now made available for us to study. It's about a system designed to get that information to us in ways we can use, and I want to come back to that. Uh, you know, we, we all presumably know that prices in healthcare mean nothing. Unfortunately, uh, policymakers don't seem to understand this, that, pol that prices literally have no meaning. This is the bill for killing my dad, uh, quite a bargain at 636, 687, 75. Remarkably precise when you look at the actual entries. Uh, our share was $992. Uh, great deal? Well, we didn't pay it. Service wasn't so terrific. I asked myself, if I put Dad at the most expensive hotel in New York, filled it with hospital equipment, made a doctor spend an hour and day with him, which about 50 minutes more than he got in the hospital, gave him round-the-clock nur uh, nursing, um, and uh, uh, I, I also gave him some room service, and some of you are probably wondering why there's no television charge. In hotels, they don't charge separately for television. Uh, that's just in hospitals. The most I could get to was $155,000. Uh, and, you know, that's basically treating dad as if he was king of Saudi Arabia. I don't know how they got to 635, 695, and 75. I know, I know where they got the 75 cents. Um, <laughs> but the important thing is when looking at prices in healthcare, remember you're looking at nothing. Fiction, fantasy, administered numbers. And the fact that we make decisions and that even hospitals themselves often allocate resources on this basis is one of the ways the system is massively broken. So what are the smart people saying? The smart people are saying we can bring down the price of health care 
by bringing down the cost. There's so much waste in the system. There's, there's all this duplication and lack of integration and lack of, I mean, it's smart, right? Everybody's saying that. Everybody's trying to do it. Accountable care organizations, this state, almost everywhere in healthcare, you, you, there's 10 articles in health affairs every month. Here's how you bring down prices by bringing down costs. It's completely wrong. So I'll show you why it's completely wrong. The greatest reduction of cost in the history of healthcare was in response to the prospective payment system. When we decided to bundle Medicare payments for hospitals, the impact, like with all incentives, was massive and rapid. The number of days in a hospital per Medicare beneficiary since then has declined by 63%. The number of days spent in a hospital for any admission has declined by 50%. Medicare is now paying for roughly 59% fewer days in hospital total, even though the Medicare population uh, close to doubled in that period of time. So when you hear about patient-centered medical homes, great news, we got the cost down by 4% and we used 5% you know, you know, fewer drugs and three hours less of nursing time, 60% of what was the single most expensive cost in healthcare in the early 80s. We've crushed it. And we all know what happened. The cost of healthcare in America plummeted. <laughs> Why didn't it plummet? It didn't plummet because at the same time what we and other businesses would call demand collapsed by half, more than half, the healthcare industry somehow managed to convince policymakers that healthcare costs, some crazy independent thing, presumably reflecting the limited amount of kryptonite we had to service healthcare, were going up. So Medicare is now paying 5x per hospital day, even as demand for hospital care has declined by 60%. Here's another fun fact, which would probably only be interesting in this room. Hospitals are claiming their costs during that period of time went up by 7.5%. So in other words, they're claiming Medicare is getting a better deal now, reimbursing them only for somewhere around 30% of their costs than they were getting before a Medicaid payment reform crushed demand. Only in healthcare can you say things like this. In any other industry, uh, we'd be dealing with insolvencies and restructurings. Now, you can believe, if you want, that cost is some independent thing that exists outside of markets. And people in healthcare actually believe, all the time, if you can decrease cost, prices will come down. I am here to tell you that it's the exact opposite. Costs come down only when prices do. I know that seems strange. But at Walmart, the reason prices are low is not because their costs are so low. The reason their costs are so low is because their prices are so low. They decided to be the low price leader and they spent every second reducing costs. The arrow works in the other direction and because we don't understand it in healthcare, we do crazy things like this. We do things that in any other industry would seem to push costs down, but because there's no competition, there's no real consumer, there's no need to lower your price, we get that. This is, um, we, we talk in healthcare about things that literally make no sense outside the economy, in the rest of the economy. Let me give you an example. One of the things everyone talks about is, co is cost shifting, right? We all know this. It's very hard to get a pure comp in healthcare of a service under these three programs for reasons that are obvious. No one has an interest in your knowing them. But here's one that was actually done in Michigan four or five years ago. Maybe someone in this room will actually did it. Um, it's an appendectomy. And we know what we're seeing here, right? We're seeing private insurance patients subsidize Medicare patients and Medicaid patients. It's cost shifting, right? Here's cost shifting in the hamburger market. These are three different hamburgers, served at very different price points. Now, nobody believes that uh, there's cost shifting between DB Bistro and McDonald's. Uh, nobody is surprised that McDonald's makes a hell of a lot more money than DB Bistro does. What happens in the hamburger market that we don't understand is happening in the healthcare market? In the hamburger market, there are many, many different ways to organize yourself to make money at different price points. 
right? If I'm McDonald's, I'm going after the discount guy. If I'm DB, I'm going after the guy who's spending a ton of money to impress his date, so much so he'll buy a $32 hamburger. It's a better hamburger, right? We, we don't expect to go into McDonald's and say, where's the tablecloth and where's the romantic lighting and can you change the music and, uh, and, and can I see the wine list? And we don't go into DB thinking, $32 for a hamburger? Are you crazy? Cheesecake Factory does a terrific job of serving a great product for a good family value meal uh, and sometimes for a date. But in healthcare, we actually seem to believe we're seeing the same service, that, that we can actually get people to disobey the law of economics. I'll tell you what I think is really happening here. I think we're seeing three different services, each one structured to assure profit at any reimbursement level. And if you talk to actual doctors who work in hospitals, the hospitals won't admit this, the way you treat a private insurance patient, the way you treat a Medicare patient, where, by the way, you can diagnosis creep and add on services and all the rest, and the way you treat a Medicaid patient, whom you won't treat, unless you can treat in real volume, are different products. They're different burgers. Uh, 1965 is when we decided to turn our public health care programs over to the insurance model through Medicare and Medicaid. In 1965, the most complicated, expensive, out-of-reach product on earth was the computer. There are roughly 20,000 of them in the world. There were very few more than 20,000 people who knew how to use them. If in 1965 someone had said to you, we are going to take this most complicated thing on earth and make sure within a couple of decades everyone's carrying one in their pocket. Your five-year-old will be able to figure out how to use it. Uh, it would have been an argument for greater spending on mental health. <laughs> in 1965, DEC introduced the first mini-computer, the first computer intended to be used by somebody other than NASA and the IRS and the Defense Department. It cost $18,000, close to $200,000 in today's money. Um, Put a perspective on $18,000 in 1965. $18,000 in 1965 was about 72 times what the average American spent on health care that year. That was the simplest to use computer where only a company like GM could buy it. It didn't have to be NASA. Um, today, you can get a pretty good laptop for roughly one-tenth of the amount you'll spend on health care per year. So it's 720x difference since the beginning of Medicare. Why? Well, you can go all sorts of reasons, particularly if you just focus on health care. But when you hear somebody say health care is complicated, I want you to think about the visionary who said, I'm going to put one of those in everybody's pocket. Here's the difference. In computers, we have created billionaires out of people who figured out how to make them simple, accessible, cheap, and by the way, uh, the friendliest, funnest consumer product on earth. In hospitals, and in medical care generally, we took what is the most personal, heterogeneous, important service, and we have made it impossible. Impossibly expensive, impossibly complex, completely lacking accountability. Anybody who thinks that's inevitable, think about healthcare and computers in 1965. Um, I want to talk a bit about dry cleaning. Uh, the most important takeaway from my presentation is do not have your dry cleaning done in Manhattan. It is incredibly expensive. But I, I don't know if you can see this bill, but this bill is part of the IT arms war in dry cleaning. So you probably remember when you took your shirts in and you'd get a handwritten thing, 10 shirts. And you'd bring the handwritten bill in and they'd lost a shirt and they'd say, nah, we miscounted. There was only nine and we didn't lose a shirt. It's nine, here are your nine shirts. And, you know, they were all women's blouses and you said, you know, I'm pretty sure these weren't mine. <laughs> so some dry cleaner said, you know what, I'm going to give that guy more confidence. I'm going to invest in a little IT. I'm going to get a computerized printout of 10 shirts, 10 men's shirts. Brought it back, nine shirts. Yeah, we miscounted, you miscounted, there was only nine, we didn't lose a shirt. 
So then the next guy said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put in that barcode what color the shirt is. And so on and so forth. What we have now is make, brand, style, everything. Why? Well, it's not because that's good for the dry cleaner. Because now when he loses my shirt, I can tell him exactly what shirt it is and exactly what I paid for it. Right? So that wasn't in his obvious interest. He did it because of the way IT actually evolves in any industry. It evolves. It's a competitive tool. No one saves money for the sake of saving money. You save money so I can give you a better price or a better service. This guy now is screwed when he loses a shirt. He's got to pay me. He charges more than the dry cleaner that only tells me 10, 10 shirts, 5 blue, you know, 4 white, what have you. Um, this is, um, these are the meaningful use rules. They don't really look like that. Uh, on the right is another technology innovation came in just about the same time as Meaningful Use did that my five-year-old taught himself how to use without an instruction manual. So language matters. You can really tell who you're talking to by language. In healthcare, we say things like patient-centered outcomes board, patient-centered medical home. General rule, if you have to say patient-centered, you aren't. Uh, this is what a healthcare expert would call a customer-centered retail establishment. <laughs> Many of you may recognize this as the single most important development in the post-World War II economy. Uh, the, sh the shipping container is estimated to have reduced the costs of shipping of almost every good on earth by 90%, some by more. It has moved hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It has created whole new cities, whole new countries, completely different supply chains. It has enabled us to move from mass manufacturing to uh, uh, custom manufacturing. It is what enables Nike to let you design your own sneakers online and get them in a week. Uh, it literally changed human geography and wealth on Earth. Uh, it is also the single most destructive economic innovation the post-war world. Whole cities, we can think of them in this country, uh, essentially went out of business because the old way of shipping and ports went away. The idea of manufacturing on a river is gone. And if you were a city built on manufacturing on a river, your competitive disadvantages are enormous. Um, unions were destroyed. Um, and it was a really dumb idea. If you're a healthcare economist and somebody came to you and said, look, the cost of shipping is the ship, sending them across the Pacific. That costs a fortune. It's a lot of fuel. It's crew. We've got to load it and unload it. And some guy comes along and says, i got a great idea. Let's fill the ship with air, because that's what this is. The way ships used to be loaded is you'd have longshoremen who were experts at putting it together like a jigsaw puzzle. How do you maximize the use of that hold with goods and services that are irregularly, uh, goods that are irregularly shaped? Well, the shipping container took that away. You take every irregular shaped good, you throw it in a box. The box is mostly air, which means now you have filled the ship's hold with air. You also required to invest in a massive new infrastructure, right? But what did it do? It lets you put something in a box, put that box in the ship without worrying about the size of the ship, where it was, what it was next to, unload it instantly, put it on a train, a truck, another ship, within a day. So. The point about the shipping container is the most important economic innovation in the history, in post-war history, would never have been allowed in healthcare because it's dumb. Right? Imagine if you walked in and said, I got a great idea for saving costs. It involves increasing costs massively. No one's going to accept that, right? We can only accept that with a real feedback loop. Here's another reason you would never do it in healthcare. Because all the good ideas in healthcare, because it's centrally managed, have to come from government or insurers. So you need to get all the stakeholders in a room. And you need to find out what's a great cost-saving idea that works for all the stakeholders. I beg you as journalists, every time you hear that, to substitute the idea of inviting a bunch of turkeys to plan your Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> you get absolutely no economic innovation, cost-saving, or disruption by talking to stakeholders. Economic disruption, true cost savings, hurts stakeholders. There's no way around it. 
And the more we decide to centrally run healthcare, the more we decide to reduce the points of decision making, the less of a chance we have of ever disrupting it. Um, I'm going to skip a couple points about where the U.S. is in the world because I'm running a little long. I just want to talk about one more place. Um, you know, we all have ideas that healthcare is expensive and is undermining economies all over the world. Here's where the United States ranks in three very important measures of public contribution to healthcare. Uh, as many of us know, most healthcare in this country is, or a lot of it is private. Unlike most OECD countries, we spend roughly 50% publicly and 50% privately. That seems to make us a real outlier. And you'll see it, it puts us just, just above uh, Mexico or below everyone else, depending on your philosophical bent. Um, but the United States spends a ton of money publicly on healthcare, the fourth most in the world per capita. And interestingly, something we all think we know, which is a lot of us are exposed to the cost of healthcare, in fact, the out-of-pocket percentage of total spending by the United States citizens is one of the lowest in the world. Most even single-payer countries have a higher burden of health care on the consumer. But here's another country that's kind of fun to think about, Singapore. In Singapore, out-of-pocket spending is 54% of health care. They have public spending only around 35%. Uh, they're right about in the middle in what that means in terms of how much they're spending. Singapore is regarded as having an excellent health care system, but I must point out it is in crisis. In fact, the government has just put together a new commission to investigate and try to address a real problem in Singapore, which is that health care spending as a percent of GDP has hit 4%. <laughs> what does Singapore do differently than everybody else on earth? Singapore has a simple principle. At point of sale, we're the customer, always. No matter who's ultimately funding it, no matter who's ultimately paying for it, each one of us as individuals is the customer. Even if the government winds up ultimately paying 90% of your bill because of subsidies and your own circumstance, you're always the customer. And interestingly, even though Singapore has health savings accounts and catastrophic health insurance, there is almost no procedure for which you can pay 100% of the procedure out of your existing funds. You still need to have a little skin in the game out of your income. Creates a health system that's at least as good as ours. Costs a mere 14% of GDP less. There's a lot of big picture stuff in healthcare. We talk all the time about big ideas. Here's what makes healthcare unique, though. There's 310 million people in this country, and 310 million people have at least one story of healthcare dysfunction. I know because they've all emailed me since I've written my piece. Some of them are fairly simple. I have a hard time finding a doctor. A doctor who keeps losing the records, forgetting their name, sends them to a specialist, doesn't tell the specialist the wrong thing. Some of them get more serious. I, I go to a hospital and my loved one is taken for a procedure meant for another patient. It happened twice to my father. And, and by the way, just as an aside, how crazy is it in this century your doctor will tell you, you got a loved one in a hospital, kind of be better if someone was th with them at all times. They have trained personnel in a hospital. Can you imagine FedEx saying to you, we'll get your package there, but probably would be best if you stayed with it all the way through the system. <laughs> These stories of dysfunction go all the way to what happened to my father, which is 100,000 people a year, maybe when you get beyond the hospitals and talk about the whole system, somewhere between 150 and 200,000 people a year die from something preventable, something that wouldn't happen if the healthcare industry invested as much in technology, systems, information, as my dry cleaner did. So when we think about healthcare, it's very tempting to think about the big picture. My argument is it's really about the little picture. This industry is not especially complex relative to others. Its challenges aren't unique. What's unique is that we've given it a pass. We're willing to each be a little picture story in healthcare. And I think when we start to say to ourselves in this century with what's happened and everything else, it's time to hold this industry accountable to the normal standards of service, quality, consistency, and value that we've seen in everything else, it'll start to change. Thanks.
So we're open for questions. So if you have a question. So uh, uh, the, qu the question, and correct me if I'm getting it wrong, is that if stakeholders can't make health care better, cheaper, safer, who can? So the argument I make is that the only way to restore the correct incentives to health care for all of those things is to create a greater role for consumers. And what that means is rebalance, it, it means two things. First, it means we're going to have to recognize we are consumers. And this idea that there's somebody between us that's protecting us is absurd. You know, if you're a senior and you think because Medicare will pay for something, it's a good idea, you're in trouble, right? That's number one. We've got to stop believing that. The second thing, though, is a more policy-oriented thing. Right now, we believe that anything insurance doesn't cover is a failing in our insurance policy. I think we need to move healthcare finance, that $2.7, $2.8 trillion, to a more normal structure which is insurance should cover those things that insurance covers, which is things that are rare, major, urgent, unpredictable. Savings should cover those things that are predictable but major, particularly things like end of life and when we're older and we know we're going to have more conditions. Uh, and everything else should be paid for normally, the way we pay for things. And again, that's why I started with Becky. Uh, when my, uh, when I, my article first came out, my general counsel came to me and said, you know, all sounds great, but one of my friends it had... Uh, his kidney did an appendectomy, coincidentally. Uh, that's a $10,000 bill. Who has $10,000 lying around? Well, I pointed out to my friend that at that time, uh, our family policy was costing us $16,000 a year. So if we gave that money to you, or the non-catastrophic portion to you, your family would run out of appendices way before you ran out of money. And what we believe is possible is so restricted by this misunderstanding of where that $2.7 trillion is coming from, that when you open up to other ways of financing health care, it is very possible to make us the centerpiece of the system, the way we are in everything else. And that is, that is what I am trying to accomplish, is to understand that some of health care is highly unusual, it's urgent, it's confusing, it's emotional, it's long-term insurable. It's your house burning down. Some of it is really like your furniture going out of style. Not insurable. Ensuring it distorts everything, right? And some of it's kind of in between. And there's no reason on earth we need to sentence ourselves to the most expensive, economically distortive, costly, uh, and disempowering system of finance to pay for everything. So I I shorthand, let's insure everybody, but not for everything. Yes? Well, so the question is, what do I think of the public option? So uh, single-payer systems uh, work in countries when you're willing to accept a budget. Fundamentally, single-payer systems are a way of bringing the saying no into health care. The United States is unwilling to have a single-payer system because at no point are we willing to let government say no, either to providers or patients. That's why the Medicare program is absolutely unique. No, no one else structures public health care as an entitlement. So in theory, I could argue that having single payer, having public discipline would be a great thing, but not in this country. And I think Medicare is a great example of it, because what Medicare has allowed is this flood, this orgy of health care. And if you've ever had a dying parent, you, you've seen someone, pretty good chances was tortured to death. Now, there's a lot of good people here. It's not evil, but it is the incentives in the system. Uh, in the most recent fiscal cliff bill, there were two special provisions pushing up the cost of medical care in Medicare. One was for dialysis. The second was for a, a form of, 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 uh, of radiology. Our political system is never going to step back and say, we're going to say no, we're going to budget, we're going to carefully, it's just not going to happen. It's not the way our country works. And so I think here the only hope is the consumer, because we do respect the consumer saying no, in a way we never, we never let government say no. Yes. Thank you for that. I was going to say that I was wondering if you could say about what happens for those who aren't paying the $2,000 for insurance right now and don't have that. 
Well, that, that was my point about how I'd rather redirect health care. Oh, I'm so sorry. So the, the question was, what about the poor in a, in a more consumer-oriented system? They're not putting in 16000 now 22000 for standard insurance, family insurance policy. Uh, what do you do about them? They're not earning an income. Let's talk about people who aren't earning income and, 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 and ratchet it up. So my estimate is that if you had a true catastrophic uh, universal insurance policy, and I would make it universal. I, I, the idea, look, what we're trying to protect in healthcare is people who are born with terrible conditions, who have horrible accidents, who are unlucky or unusual. All of us, sadly, are going to die. All of us are going to get sick. All of us are going to have our year in that top 10%, almost all of us. Uh, we can't protect against it. We can't insure against it. What we're trying to protect against is people who either desperately need care because of a serious, unusual illness, a, a, a major problem that they could never we could never have budgeted for, the, the rarer ones, or somebody who just doesn't have resources uh, because of income or, or other reasons. So uh, my argument there is you have a catastrophic insurance system that truly covers everybody cradle to grave. It's not so complex. It doesn't change when you change jobs. You get married. You have kids. The kids got it's ridiculous, right? It's a ridiculous way to run an insurance system. Insane complexity. And by the way, there's $1,700 per household per year in just the cost of administering the insurance system. $1,700, that's what some countries pay for health care. That's what we pay just for administration. The second piece of it, though, is what I mentioned, which is I'd rather spend the $850 billion we're spending just on subsidizing care for whom we define as the needy, seniors and the poor. It's going to go up under Obamacare to about a trillion, a trillion one on their estimates. I'd rather just give people the money, pay their catastrophic premiums, deposit the rest in a savings account. So what does that look like? If an insurance premium costs somewhere between two and four thousand dollars, two thousand for kids, four thousand for adults, and you're giving everyone eighty-five hundred bucks, they save somewhere between four and six thousand dollars a year for a health savings account. You got a family of four; we're talking about thirty thousand dollars. It's so much a better system because one of the things it does, going back to my hamburger thing, is it stops what we're doing here, which is if you're genuinely poor and you're on Medicaid. Some services you can get because they make economic sense for providers. Many services you can't because they don't. To actually having people all participate in the same healthcare system in the same way. To me, that is such an enormous uh, social welfare goal that it's extraordinary to me that even those for whom social welfare is a priority are moving in exactly the opposite direction. Irene, I'm going to repeat your question. Tell me if I got it right. So Irene's question was about innovation in a private company like mine. How do you encourage innovation? The point I made about stakeholders being in a room isn't a way to get innovation. Um, how do you encourage them, discourage those whose interest is retaining the status quo? So there's only one reason for innovation in business, and that's competition. We don't innovate for the sake of innovating. I mean, by the way, if you were willing to watch black and white game shows on my network, I'd, make, I'd, I'd keep showing you the same black and white television shows. The only reason we ever do anything new in business is to sell it to you because the other guy is going to sell it to you. That was my point about the dry cleaning. That's it. Without the competition, nobody goes into business for the sake of innovating for the sake of innovating. And that's one of the disciplines also is you don't, look, a Apple could easily introduce a solar powered iPhone, right? The, the innovation's there, the technology's there. They don't do it because the market's not there. That discipline is crucial. And my argument about stakeholders was really about cost savings, right? Which is, hey, by the way, the same thing in my business, right? If I get everybody in the room and say, let's talk about ways to save money, we're going to buy fewer pencils. Unfortunately, the way businesses save money is by making really hard decisions. And the reason we save money is to compete on price. And, or because we have to, right? Prices have come down. Demand has come down. We've got to save money. You get everybody in the room, nobody says, here's my idea. Fire me. I don't do anything. No one says that. That was actually me, uh, and that is my actual job. But that's the key, is that front end is discipline. It's the feedback loop. It's the, you know what, more pixels, more sales. Solar powered, not so much. So it's not about innovation for innovation's sake. It's about innovation for a purpose. The reason business is good at it is only because we're forced to be. Not because we're not better people. We're actually worse people than exist in healthcare. But it's that being bad. It's that, how am I going to beat the other guy? that drives the innovation. We've got time for one more question over here.
Thank you. So the, the, the question was about market failure, which you know, is, is when markets don't properly allocate resources because of some structural problem. And the solution usually is to have the public do it. How do I reconcile that with what I'm talking about? So, you know, I think it's an excellent point. There's a lot of market failure in everything. So uh, the latest thinking on how you handle things like market failure, and I want to come back to healthcare, but just to be clear, is the bear analogy which is market failure is a bad thing because it's misallocation of resources, high prices, too little supply, too much supplied, uh, what have you. So the question always is, is an overt solution better than letting evolution occur and the market failure either evolve out or evolve in a different direction? You may be aware one of the great examples of market failure in computers was that Microsoft had absolute complete dominance because of uh, economies of network economies in, in, in office, which led them to try to dominate the browser market and cause lots of antitrust action and all the rest. You also probably know the rest of the story as well, which is Microsoft is almost irrelevant in the Internet today, just a decade later, right? So there what happened is the market failure worked itself out because Google came along and innovated, and then Apple was able to innovate as well. So the first question you have to ask is, just because I have market failure, am I better off intervening? That's what I think Kenneth Arrow's mistake was. Of course, the market for healthcare services is, is, uh, uh, is um, imperfect. Every market actually is. There are no perfect markets. The question is, am I more likely to get innovation and better things by letting it function or by overtly regulating it? Now, I happen to believe the insurance market in healthcare is irreconcilably failing, that you can't fix it by innovation, which is why for a you know, wild, crazy free market guy, I argue for single pool national health insurance. Because I don't think there's actual any, particularly as insurers will get better at underwriting, or what has to replace underwriting now that underwriting's involved, they're going to know in 10 years exactly what it is you are. And if you really let an insurance marketplace run, essentially everyone would just be paying for their own care because they'd be able to underwrite you perfectly. I don't think that's a market that will ever function. And so actually in that case, I think for insurance, and I think one of the mistakes we've made, I, I don't think private insurance can work in healthcare. It's not because they're bad, it's just because of that. There's a fundamental information economies of scale problem. So I think there are some areas where we need the public. Uh, and, and, and insurance actually is one. If we want to protect people, cradle the grave against catastrophe, I, I personally, there are others who argue differently. I don't know another way to do it other than single pool. But I want to add one more point because it's something I'm asked all the time. I am not calling for getting rid of the government. I, I happen to be a Democrat. Um, we live off the government. Um, <laughs> I am calling for changing the government's role. And, and, and just to finish on the safety issue I started, one of the problems we have in regulating safety in healthcare is that government is the customer, the biggest customer, their partner. The reason that, that Medicare pays for my, hosp my uh, hospital killing my father is because if they don't pay for the hospital killing my father, then they gotta pay, you know, more carefully for taking care of Carl's father. It all comes out of their money at the end of the day. I want government to be a vigorous, active regulator of the healthcare system. And I don't think it can do it when it's compromised as the customer. And, you know, we all talk about single payer and government role in healthcare as if it's a solution. It is not the solution in the defense business where we have single payer. We have enormous issues of value uh, and quality. We don't know any other way to run defense other than single payer, but we have it as an example. So I guess my point is, I, I'm not interested in this, you know, government good, industry bad, industry good, government bad argument. It's not interesting to me. What's interesting to me is that there's lots of different roles we see people play in everything. We see a role for consumers, we see a role for markets, we see a role for innovators trying to make money, and we see a role for governments. I'm calling for a rebalance, not one instead of the other, but actually having each do what it's great at. We want to drive innovation and price in healthcare. We've got to use markets. And there's almost no way to use markets without using consumers. And to me, that rebalancing is the only way we're ever going to get healthcare to resemble a late 20th century industry, much less a 21st century industry. That's David, David's going to be taking questions in the exhibit hall. He's going to be signing his book. So if you want to bring your questions over there, he'll be there in a few minutes. Thank you.